right, so first we're going to talk about the case study two. So what I would do is put up the question or like the um, the problem. Oh, I'll just share this here. Yeah, so I put up this here and um, give you five minutes ish to talk with your neighbor. Ideally, not somebody you work with on case study too about your project results. So you feel free to uh, go to Moodle to grab the write up that you have and you with your neighbor. And again, like last time, I'm going to invite um, volunteers to talk about what they did and then um, maybe cover some extra modeling approaches that can be helpful. So take your time. Um, that was your here. Yeah, yeah. Really like maybe hear from some of you your approaches, <laughs> results, and then if you got the chance to, um, yeah, check out the other people's work, any kind of similarities and differences that you have um, observed, feel free to, um, to talk about it. So, just a quick overview it's 40 true or false questions. Okay, we're looking at the score. Um, so if you get it correct, it's one. If it's not, it's zero. And then so the total score is going to be 40. Okay. And there are 15 people on this exam. So the question in the um, original write-up here is some analysis claimed by this course is that the first five were just randomly guessing. The last 10 have some level of knowledge. And we're trying to um, answer that overall question. So curious about the Bayesian models that you chose. And then of course, um, I guess many of you are using JAX to do the actual MCMC simulation. So um, I can just like last time bring up um, the write-up from, from some of you and then we can talk about the model as well as the results and um, all that. Okay, so anybody wants to start? <coughs> Sarah, thank you. So let me bring up yours. Okay. So give me one more second. I have to share the correct document. All right. Okay. Um, so we did like a beta binomial model mm -hmm. um, where we were pulling. Um, so we decided to use a hierarchical model because they are doing the same. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm mm -hmm. sorry for you to go back. Mm -hmm. So we split into the two groups to answer that que that initial question. Mm -hmm. So um, we kind of assume that there's different, oh, I misspelled different. So we give different, um, well, not different greater priors, but we simulate different greater priors for each PJ. Mm -hmm. um, probability of, of success for the guessing group, probability of success for the knowledge group. Um, and then we pull from, um, uh, different distributions, or then we pull from the same distribution for alpha and beta as the parameters. Mm -hmm. So we're assuming that they do share some mm -hmm. knowledge, especially because they're like they do the same test, mm -hmm. and it's from the same. <laughs> yeah, someone just joined without muting it. So. Okay, sorry, keep going. Um, and so we ran. So we gave those priors. Mm -hmm. um, that one made sense to me because you can kind of go because of the means that you can derive from mm -hmm. those like mm -hmm. the possible like values of means that you can get um, from those given uh, uniform distributions. Um, so maybe really quickly, so the group, I guess this one here, you coded yourself, right? Like you define the first five to be group one and the last ten to be group two. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. grouped five. So great. Okay, yeah, group five. All right, yeah, sorry, keep going. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, sure. it must be coded in there somewhere. Uh, it's probably at the beginning, I think you're using, um, right, like you're trying to make sure the first five is group one and the second 10, set of 10. And then that's why you have J, like half to J is two, right? So you have two groups and then each of the group has the same um, prior, oh, sorry, the success probably, uh, probability, which is the parameter in this case, and then you assume both of them coming from the same data. Okay. Yeah. 
It's just beta because this should be between 0 and 1. Right? <coughs> All right. Can you jump down to see the finding? I noticed that you were thinking 2. Yes, when we first got it, mm -hmm. um, the effective sample size mm -hmm. was about 2,500. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Closer to 5,000. Mm -hmm. Um, and it looked um, like it had explored the parameter space at that point. Mm -hmm. So I have assumed it converged. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think from our results, we get significant differences in what the means are um, for each PJ. So, so PJ1, mm -hmm. um, it's like about 50%, which would be what it would be for guessing, random guessing. Mm -hmm. And then PJ2, it's about 86%, which mm -hmm implies prior knowledge because it's above mm -hmm. significantly above 50 percent mm -hmm. which is guessing mm -hmm. <coughs> all right sounds good so i think the results from sarah and kelly uh, well first of all the model itself um breaks those um 15 people into two groups manually okay the first five and then the last 10. and then uh they're doing hierarchical way because they give the same beta prior for beta uh, for pj okay and they actually Furthermore, letting the hyperpriors alpha and beta to be random. So that's why the output that you see, uh, we can also make inference about them, even though I guess uh, in terms of interpretation, it might not be that like um, easy to interpret, but we can focus on PJ one and two, and then looking at their final output, especially the media in this case, that the first group is indeed random guessing based on the posterior summary. And then the second group definitely has some knowledge like higher knowledge than the first group when they're doing the exercise. Okay. All right, thank you. Other groups like following the same um, process mostly? Different choice of prior, anybody? Yeah, okay. Uh, let me stop here. And then, can you use up it? one more second? I'll have to share this one. All right, go ahead. We used a very similar process, so mm -hmm. we did split them into two groups, mm -hmm. um, the first five guessers and mm -hmm. the other 10 as non-guessers. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also used beta binomial, mm -hmm. but we used a different hyper prior, and we had the, the PJs coming from different beta distributions, mm -hmm. so we're not sharing information across groups, mm -hmm. um, and that was just because we had pretty different expectations mm -hmm. for what their um, probabilities would be. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one um, we thought in um, they would get about like 20 successes and 20 failures. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one they would get um, about 35 successes and five failures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you put Poisson yeah. for N and M. So they are yeah. Hyper, they're actually Those hyper, are the hyper parameters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then you give, okay. And then for P1, which is the guessing group, you give beta and N, yeah. right? Okay. So beta, so what about P2? You're using M and 40 minus M? Is there yeah. an actual like, reason for doing that? Um, so because there are, we knew there were 40 trials mm -hmm. in the actual experiment, mm -hmm. we were basing it off that. So the idea is like, if we were to guess how many um, successes they would have in 40 mm -hmm. trials, we thought it would be about 35. Mm -hmm. And that the, um, the ones, the uh, fit number of failures would be 40 minus right. how many right. successes they have. Yeah, so again, Good point, because theta, if you remember, um, if, especially if you're doing through a prior, the first parameter for the beta is the prior sample size for the success, right? And the second parameter is the prior sample size for the failures, the count of failures. So um, I guess my only, I mean, it probably wouldn't change much of the results here, uh, but if I were, I might just also do n and 40 minus n here. Because oh. I understand, I guess you're trying to do like equally, sex, yeah. right? Yeah, but if you define n and m to be the number of correct answers, mm -hmm. it might make more sense to be, let's say, here is n and here is 40 minus n, which is uh, coherent oh. with the last, yeah, but I doubt it will be like too big a difference. Yeah, we um, uh -huh. actually got very similar estimates mm -hmm. to yeah, so let's Sarah's graph down um, here. Uh -huh. yeah. Great. Pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
And your N and M, yeah, so it's interesting because here in this case, N and M, because we sort of know what they represent, right, in the beta priors that we choose. So if we're looking at their um, posterior and um, summary, like this is around 20, which is like the postal, I mean, I guess doesn't, yeah, it does not change much from the prior, at least yeah. at the mean, and then M again in here. So notice, I think all of this will be because in JAX, because you give it Poisson distribution, so every time when they sample, it has to be an integer. Right? So that's why, because Poisson is model an integer. So that's why you see those uh, posterior summary here for lower 95%, um, median, upper, and mean. Well, mean, again, is you're taking average, so it will be some non-integer numbers, but everything else will be integer. And it's still, I just want to mention that this is correct because you're using Poisson, and Poisson has to be has to be an um, integer value. All right, and I guess here, well, the, the blacks were overall fine, but you can do for the thingy if you want. Yeah. Yeah, and um, all right. Sounds good. Anything else? Any other comments, questions? Yeah, they yeah. We had a question about sure. hyperpriors. Mm -hmm. We also did the beta by million. Mm -hmm. And like, we we're kind of confused, like, what the point of using a hyperprior distribution is versus mm -hmm. just like, Picking numbers because, like, we have no knowledge. Right, yeah. So, right. So, the thing, I guess, the question here is whether we should let this N and, and earlier, I guess, the alpha and beta or AB, whether we should let them to be random or should we let yeah. them to be fixed, right? Yeah. yeah. So, for here again, I think it probably wouldn't matter that much, especially like the previous case with A and B is really hard to interpret what they are. So, whether we want them to be random. Or not? I mean, I think I think it's a it's a personal question. Yeah. And if you um, do have strong opinion, but the thing is, I think many of you are probably are wondering as well that we we looked at the data and we know that well, it's most likely not going to be random or random. I don't want to make inference about it. So, so for this case, I think we can be flexible. Yeah. And um, well, for the case that um, Caroline Shenshik did, as you can see the results. Well, um, the mean, for example, n and n they do not differ that much from its prior. So in fact, if you want to do 20 and 35 for sure, like not even like let N and M to be random, my guess is for PJ1 and PJ2 will still be very close to what you have over here, the results. Okay, So it's definitely like a um, balance of how many parameters that you want in the model. And then um, because the more that you have, uh, usually the larger size of data you prefer because you're gonna have a more parsimonious model. Um, but if not, you can you can always just fix them and then go from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All very similar results with PJ1 and PJ2. Great. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So um, to summarize, or maybe just to um, offer some extra extra ideas here, that um, I'm guessing. Yeah. So I'm guessing because I wrote the question. Well, this happened last time as well when I wrote the question that people were saying that the first uh, 10 might be random guessing, the uh, first five might be random guessing, right? And then the second 10 might be, um, uh, be, be the knowledgeable group or something. So maybe because the way that the questions are phrased that many of you will automatically go into that I'm gonna code the first five to be one group and then the last 10 to be another, right? That's typically what you did. Like say, create a new column with this group variable that's all fine, uh, but there is another way to think about modeling this kind of data is what we call latent class forms. So I want to cover this and then give you a chance to, I wouldn't say redo the uh, case study too, but we're going to just turn it into a new case study three to let you to try this new approach to modeling. So what I mean by latent class modeling is that the approaches that you guys took is for sure the first group is the first group, the second group is the second group, right? But what we mean by latent class is what if we want the model to be so flexible that we don't know where each person, like which group of person belongs to? We put a latent class, like say we're gonna be have two classes in total, like what we did before, or group. And the first one is going to be the random guessing group. So we still have those two groups existing. 
and the other one is knowledgeable group. Uh, but the difference now is we don't assume for sure which group each person goes to. We let that to be random. Okay, we let that to to be determined by the model or by the inference procedure. So a way to think about this model is say we still have yi, which is the outcome, right? So that we know is binomial, like all of you had done. It's uh, 40. That's the number of um, success, oh, sorry, number of trials that you do, right? And let's just say this pi that you have, which is now, as you can see, is going to be um, person-specific success probability. Okay, um, but it doesn't mean that we have that many parameters. Because the way to think about this pi. Let me think about how to write this. So we're going to define this ZI for simplicity. Let's say ZI is either one or two. Okay. So ZI is an indicator here that if it's one, it's going to be the random guessing group. If it's two, it's going to be the knowledgeable group. Okay. So this is a way that you can introduce this extra layer of uncertainty. Of, I don't know which group this person is going to belong to, but I'm going to use the indicator to show what it is. Okay. So this PI, the success probability for this particular person, will be con like conditional on the I. And what we're trying to do is for everybody, let me see a different color. So for everybody in the random guessing group, which is group number one, we're going to give it the same success probability, let's say P1. Okay. And for everybody in the knowledge group, which is number two, we're going to give P2, which is the success probability. So we assume that everybody in the random guessing group is going to share the same success probability. Okay. And everybody in the knowledgeable group will share the same success probability. One is P1, the other one is P2. Okay. So that's why when you work in this way, you can say that, well, when, um, I would say, when, when ZI equals to one, then P, I don't know how to write this most, uh, most efficiently. I'm trying to write that when ZI equals to one, PI, a PI equals to P1, because we'll just be the success probability of the first group, right? And then when this equals to two, it's going to be P2. Okay. So this is a way that I'm trying to make sure that I'm going to decide which group or which class the person goes to. And once I determine that assignment, I'm going to use the same success probability for that group and the other success probability for the other group. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you have to introduce, say, what we call a latent class parameter. And now if you look at the um, cover sheet of the example, or like of the case study two, I provided some JAX script, like sample script. So one of, I think some of you were wondering earlier about that before. Come on. That's a command in JAX that you can check whether, like, say, if you do equal x and y, it's gonna it's gonna become one if x and y equals to each other. Okay, it's gonna become zero if x and y does not equal to each other. And what that is trying to help you to think about is, well, if I'm actually gonna determine my pi given my zi, I have to check what my zi is. Right. So for that matter, you can think about this equal. Say, um, for each observation, I'm going to check ZI against one. Let's say this. If it's going to be one, this observation I is going to be in group one, right? And then if it's going to be zero, this observation is going to be in group two. Okay. Yeah, so there will be some extra thinking and try and error for you to try using JAGS to implement something like this. What I would do is maybe I would share some simple sample script of the JAX, the model, to you on Moodle before you work on what we call like the new case study two or like case study three to work with this data set by using this approach. Okay. And one more thing I would say is before we break to talk about multiple linear regression, how many parameters do you think this model now has? 
because it's, well, for whatever we want to keep track on, we know that in JEX, we have to use a monitor to track them, right? So let's sort it out first before we go into it. How many parameters? And then, of course, which are the parameters that you want to monitor in order to answer your question? And pause here, you can check with your neighbor. And let me know if you want me to re-explain the model a little bit. I know we went a little bit fast and uh, happy to do that as well. Yeah, Josh, question for uh, How does the assignment work first? Mm -hmm. what yeah, you what do you all think? So just now we talked about once we know this some assignment, we know that PI, if CI is one, it should be P1, right? The first group or the random guessing group. And if it's two, it's going to be P2. So those two definitely their parameter, right? We want to model them. And this two, I would say, uh, the way to give priors to them can be very similar to what you already did. Because the first group, right, is going to be like maybe random guessing. So maybe you put some data center at 0.5. If you want to do that. And then for P2, maybe you would do it higher. Or like the truncated uniform that you, some of you did in in, uh, in the current uh, case study too. So the question now is, how can we determine ZI? ZI is gonna take two values, right? Either one or two. And how can we, well, they're gonna be random, right? Because we don't know what they are. And actually, at each iteration, the ZI might change, right? Because maybe at one iteration, you're gonna assign um, the ith person into group one. Maybe another, you're gonna assign it to group two. So my question for you, and also just following up um, Josh's question, what do you think we can do about um, working with ZI as random and then how to factor that into the JEX model? What do you think you would do? For each ZI we want to, so when we're trying to write JEX, we write the sampling model, right? The prior and hyper priors, whatever. So ZIs, they are random here. There are parameters. So naturally, we want to give them prior distribution. So what kind of prior distribution do you think ZI should be given? So maybe let's focus on that with a quick discussion between your neighbors. Yeah, so for now, it returns your own one. Okay, so we would do that. Yeah, but you can play with that. You can make instead of zero one, you can make one. Or you can just return zero one and then one. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, so just sort of throughout the notation. Yeah, so. For ZI, uh, because they are binary in nature, I mean, in the way that we write them up right now, it's one or two. So, uh, but still, you only have two outcomes, right? So, a natural prior for this will be a Bernoulli, because you can either be one group or the other group. But we know Bernoulli, because Bernoulli is a special binomial, well, from the example, sorry, the exam last time, that Bernoulli is a special case of binomial where you only take one trial. Okay, so the outcome is going to be either a success or failure. So that's why typically Bernoulli is going to be even one or zero. Okay, so for us, well, one thing you can do is I just code everything, maybe instead of, instead of two, I code everything into zero. And then that will work. If you want to like just keep using Bernoulli to be zero, one output. But you can also do, if you like the group one and group two, this kind of setup, you can also do one and two. And like what Sarah is saying, once I take a draw of the Bernoulli, if it's going to be zero, it's going to be my new one, right? If it's going to be one, it's going to be my new two. So you can just add one thing to it if you want, right? So things might sound a little vague, but like I said, um, grab the general idea of the approach, and I will share some sample Jack script for you to play with. And then in the end, you can settle down on your own model and stuff. Yes, Josh. After using the Bernoulli distribution for randomly sampling Z, um, is it okay to have an imbalanced class? Like, for example, like there are 14 points that have been randomly assigned to be one. Yeah, right. One yeah, good class. point. So the thing is, yeah, since we've been talking about Bernoulli, so Bernoulli has this, I, I need to use a different format. I like different notation because everything is the same. But so let me do theta. Theta. But theta is the success probability. Okay, so success probability in our definition here, let's say becoming or like belonging to group one. Okay, so you will have to give a prior, or like I should say, you might want to give a particular value for theta, or you want it to be random as well. But if you want it to be fixed, let's say, because we know, like looking at data to some degree, that we know maybe one third of them are random guessing, right? And two thirds of them are not random guessing. 
So theta, a good choice, if you want to fix it, might be one over three. Because a priori, you think maybe one third of the people are gonna go to the random guessing group. And then the remaining two thirds will go to the knowledgeable group, okay? But just like what Aiden was asking earlier, well, how much further we want to give prior or hyper prior to these parameters. You can either fix it, like one over three, that's totally fine. I just believe that's gonna be one third. Or you can even let that to be random and give water prior that you want to give. Yes? Um, so, like after, after a data point gets mm -hmm. a Z assigned to mm -hmm. it, I guess I'm confused, like, what if it's wrong, like, like how does it correct that? Because yeah. you can tell if it's wrong or not. Like, yeah, good point, about. right. So, yeah, so once you're on the MCMC through JETS, you can summarize. So apparently we have many parameters now. So one thing is about this P1 and P2, right? This two, they're definitely random. We're trying to make inference about them. All of this is going to be random as well. So if you want to track them, you can track them as well. Mm -hmm. And you have, what, 15? 15 people, so you're gonna have 15 different things. And if you run it for like 5,000 iterations, it's gonna have a big matrix of all of the stuff. So one thing interesting for you to try, if you get a chance to do it, is that, well, maybe I wonder for the first person out of this um, data set, I wonder how many times across my 5,000 iterations, how many times this person is classified as the first group, which is the random guessing, or, and of course, the other side is how many times, which is complementary to, to that number or percentage of um, the first person going to be belonging to the second group. Okay? So what I can tell, I'm guessing, is when you see, like, so total score is, what, 40, right? Anybody remember, like, say, maybe the lowest score among the 15? Anybody roughly remember something? So <clears throat> for those extreme cases, like observation, Let's say, it's, let's say max is, I don't know, 40, and the min is, let's say, 15. Let's say that's what it is. So for observations of those extreme values, the model, I would say when you check the, like the ZI assignment, 17, yeah, thank you. Yeah, when you check the ZI assignment across the iterations, for observations of those extreme values, a very high percent of time is going to be classified as a random guessing group. Okay? Whereas for super high score, well, those group, uh, those observations will most likely be classified as knowledge group. It's gonna be some observations in between, let's say 30 or 35, uh, 35 might be really high, 32 or like 30-ish or maybe 28. Those observations with scores like that, they might be like classified maybe equally or like not equally, but like sort of evenly comparing to those extreme cases. So that's actually another interesting, to interesting thing to check when you're doing latent class model because yes, we don't know for sure which group each person should belong to. But this kind of model allows you to let it to be random and then you can summarize those posterior estimation as well. So maybe for the top performer, like get 40 out of 40 every time this person will be classified as a knowledgeable group. And for that person with 17 score, Maybe unfortunately he was just or she or they were just randomly guessing all the time, so it's always going to be classified. Yes, maybe. So are we like when we were testing testing the hypothesis mm -hmm. that the first fiber guessing mm -hmm. is the letter fiber and we have some knowledge? Are we actually updating the priors like thetas? Mm, right, this one, the theta for the group. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So yeah, this is a great point. So I'm guessing Maggie was trying to say that we, in order to answer that question I wrote on the cover sheet, you might really want to set theta to be random, right? Because we actually don't know if it's a one third divide, like five people in one group and 10 people in the other, right? So it might make sense to give theta to be random. You can give it <coughs> another theta prior if you want, it's gonna be a success probability and all that. Uh, but there's some subtlety here because once you start doing latent class model, you're not only talking about the first five or the class 10, is everybody can be in one of the two groups. And you can actually get summarized or summary of each of the person. So you can actually get even more detailed, like summary or like results for different person here. Yes? For defining P1 and mm -hmm. P2 and J, yeah. would you use like 
if statement or is there a way to do the condition? Yeah, good point. Yeah, so I guess I, I was going too fast earlier. So that's what this equal is trying to help you. So P1 and P2 or P0, whichever you define in this way, let's just say P1, P2. So they are success probability. So the prior, in the prior chunk that you're going to give, they're just going to be both, I don't know, like beta, some kind of beta that you give, right? But then in order to determine for each observation what is the PI is going to take, it's actually going to be conditioning on the value of Z, right? So when you're a ZI, which is the latent class assignment, what we call, we call it assignment, if it's one, we want this PI to be P1, right? And when it's two, let's say two here, we want PI to be P2. Okay? So the equal statement, which is actually an operator here, that if you set this for each ZI, for each observation, you check this ZI, you check if it's equal to one. If it is, it's going to be the same group, uh, sorry, the first group. So they're going to take P1 as the success probability. Okay? If it's zero, by our definition here, it's going to be the second group. So you're going to take P2. So it's not so much an if statement about P. It's more about the Z. But then to avoid using if statement, you can use equal operator. You still have to do something with PI gets if else oh, I equals see. Z. Uh, well, yeah, so it depends on how you code it. One way, well, again, I will share the sample script, but one thing, good question. So one thing you can think of is, because this is going to return you binary, right? One mm -hmm. or zero, okay, or one or two, whichever you code it. And then you can just put oh, it no. into, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you put it into, maybe you have a vector of P1, P2, yeah. and then it's going to be either the first one or the second one, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. Yeah, but it's good to think about this. So yes, in actually, actually to implement this through some subtlety, so like I said, in class, let's grasp what the model is trying to do and then think about the different type of um, like parameters and what are the parameters that we want to summarize. And after class, for the last uh, case study, I will share some sample R script, mostly JEX, the model part. And then you have to determine what kind of prior that you want to give for P1, P2, theta, if you want to do the render or not, and then all of the other stuff that you want to do. Okay, so I will, yeah, I will just reassign people to the last case study, and um, after class, I will make the announcement as well as the central script that I want to share. Okay, any questions about this? Well, we still get time. I think next Thursday when we discuss case studies, we will go into more of this detail. Um, yeah, so for my whole PhD dissertation, I've been doing late in class modeling for, for many years, so I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but happy to answer more questions. And this are the case of only two groups, but you can have many other groups if you want, if you have different groups. And one type of model that I've been working on is we can actually allow infinite number of groups out there. And then you're going to let the data decide how many you want. So the infinite number is trying to let it to be flexible. I don't know how many groups I need, so I'm just going to let it go. It can go up to infinity, but there are certain uh, MCMC techniques that you can use a truncated version of that to, to do a good approximation. All right, okay, so that's for this thing.